Good evening, good evening. How you doing out there? Good evening, Sister Pat. Good evening, Sister Pat. Good evening, Sister Lynn Stevenson. Auntie Lynn, good evening. Sister Von Towns, good evening. Sister Von Towns. Good evening, good evening. Let me see if I can bring the chat on the screen. Good evening, Brother Faison. Good evening, Eliza Upshaw. Good evening, Sister Brenda Smith. Sister Esther McDougal Johnson. Auntie Lynn. Good evening, good evening. Sister Darlene Hill. Brother Jameer Cunningham. Wrong button. Good evening, Sister Julia Ross. Tasha Cooper, good evening to you, good evening. Glory to God, glory to God. Sister Linda B. from Georgia. And Sister Esther McDougal Johnson, good evening, good evening. God bless you. I apologize in advance, I do have a bit of a pimple under my nostril, which is why I'm kind of tilted to the side right now, so. Sorry about that. If you're watching in HD, I apologize. Hopefully it's going soon. Sorry. It's just not attractive. Good 
Deacon Butler, good to see you, Deacon Butler. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Tonight we're going to be talking about John 4, 35 and 42. Holy harvest, the holy harvest. Holy harvest, the holy harvest. John 4, 35 to 42. Good evening, Sister Stephanie Cunningham. Good evening. Amen. Good evening, Sister Linda B. from Georgia. Listening. Good evening to you as well. Let's always remember to read and follow God's words. Always. Good evening once again, Sister Pat. Good evening, Sister Pat. God bless you. We'll start in about six minutes or so. Good evening, Brother Jameer Cunningham. Good evening. Sorry, Sister Pat. Sorry about that. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Good evening, Sister Stephanie Cunningham, Brother Kirk Peterson. Good evening to you. God bless you. And Sister Tatisa Nesbitt. Good evening. Good evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, humble Lord God, just thanking you and praising you for all the wonderful things you've done. You are great, and you are greatly to be praised, Lord God. Lord God, help us to wholly harvest the holy harvest, Lord God. We thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins and to be raised on the third day for our justification that all who are faithful to Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life, Lord God. Help us be good messengers of the good message, Lord God. Help us to spread the seed, the good seed of the gospel, praying that it falls on good soil, that it will bear much fruit, 30, 60, 100 times what was sown, Lord God. Help us to harvest the holy harvest Lord God knowing that it is you who works in us and all that we do Lord God help us to continue continually labor for we know that our labor for the Lord is not in vain Lord God we ask the forgiveness of our sins in the name of Jesus Christ forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us we thank you for the opportunity to gather as brothers and sisters virtually Lord God and to talk more about your word help us to Meditate on your word and allow it to challenge us and examine us, Lord God. Speak to our hearts, Lord God, right now through your word and allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Good evening, brother Tobin and sister Terry Rice. Happy, happy belated birthday to you, sir. And good evening, Sister Tatisa Nesbitt. Nesbitt. Good evening, Sister Nancy Pope White. God bless you all. Heart, 
brother, Freddie Minkins, good evening. Amen, Sister Cooper. Amen, Sister Nesbitt. So once again, we're going to be in John, continue our study of John 4 that we've done the last couple of weeks, a sermon two Sundays ago, and then last week's Bible study. Tonight we'll be in John 4, 35 to 42, Holy Harvest, the Holy Harvest. Good evening, Sister, jo Sister Julia Ross, good evening. And once again, I'm sorry, I do have a, a some irritation under my nostril, which is why I'm angled. Hopefully it's not too much of an eyesore for you. I apologize. Perhaps I can edit it out in post, but we'll see. Good evening, Sister Rena Civils. Good evening. Good evening, Sister Alice Palmer. Good evening, Sister Palmer. Good evening, Sister Brenda Smith. Let's have a blessed evening. And good evening, Sister Robin Smith. Good evening. Good evening, Sister Sibbles. Good evening, Sister Gail McGinnis Scott. All right. Good evening, Sister Sarah Dorsey. Good evening, Sister Dorsey. Let me turn this microphone down so when the train goes by, we don't hear all the background noise. Good evening, good evening. Check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. Testing, one, two, check, one, two. Testing, one, two. All right. Holy harvest, the holy harvest. Holy harvest, the holy harvest. Brothers and sisters, as Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are plenty of people who are ripe to be harvested for the kingdom of heaven, to be brought to firsthand faith in Christ the King. But there needs to be more workers who wholly devote themselves to this holy work. Some may plant the seed of the gospel. Others may water it. And others may reap the fruit of previous labor. But we're all on the same team. The Lord's team that seeks to win souls for the Savior of the world. Now, for the past couple of weeks, we've talked about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. We said that we all know that when we get hungry, we often don't feel like ourselves. When we haven't eaten in a while, many of us become hangry. And if we're honest, when we hunger physically, we often seek to feed our stomachs food that is not healthy. And in the same way, when we get spiritually hungry, when we hunger spiritually, we often don't feel like ourselves. When we haven't eaten spiritually in a while, many of us become spiritually hangry. And when we hunger spiritually, we often seek to feed our souls, to feed our souls food that is not healthy. We may have cravings for spiritual junk food, which may taste good in the moment, but can cause long-term spiritual health issues. It might take away the hunger pains for a little while, but later we feel empty and we crave more. We need to crave healthy spiritual food, which brings everlasting satisfaction. We need the Lord to help us change our spiritual diet and our spiritual appetite. In our previous lesson, we discussed John 4, 27 to 34, where Christ talks about his true spiritual food food that we should also crave food that we should also crave
the disciples were talking about they were talking about the material food at the well. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual food of doing God's will. And as followers of Christ, as imitators of Jesus, we should also strive to do the will of him who sent us. Who sent us. And we have been sent to come, see, and tell about Jesus. Like the Samaritan woman, let's be a good witness. And as God's witnesses who testify about the good news of our resurrected Lord, we are also God's harvesters. Now, as you've seen, with the woman at the well, Jesus was not merely talking about natural water, nor with his disciples was he merely talking about natural food. In the same way, in tonight's text, Jesus is also not merely talking about a natural harvest. He's talking about the spiritual harvest of God's people. A harvest that is already underway and that will be consummated when Christ comes back. We all need to be on God's harvest field. And we must all remember that we are to all work together. That we are to work all together. Christian missions is a team sport. So no missions are solo missions. We're all on the same team. The Lord's team that seeks to win souls. And when one scores, the whole team scores. Thus the whole team should should rejoice together. Brothers and sisters, working together as a whole, let's strive to wholly harvest God's holy harvest. All right, let me look at the chat real quick. Amen, Sister Tatisa Nesbitt. Sister Roberta Ricks Gardner. Good evening, Granddaddy Van. Sister Yvonne Rhodes, good evening. Thank you, Sister Nancy. Good evening, Pastor Scott. Good evening, Gail McGinnis Scott, Sister Scott. God bless. All right, so let's review a little bit of what we talked about last week. And then flow right into this week's text. Good evening, Sister Diane Williams. Good to see you on YouTube. All right, so before we finish the account of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 35 to 42. Let's review last week's text. Beginning at John 4, 27, it says, and just then, his disciples came and were astonished that he was speaking with the woman. Though no one asked, what is it that you seek? Or why do you speak with her? Then she left her water jar and went into the city. And she says to the men, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. This couldn't be the Messiah, could it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. John four twenty seven to 30. Now, as we've said, water jars were valuable items and would not be left sitting around unless there was an emergency. And the Samaritan woman likely leaves it because of her sense of urgency. Likewise, for us, Telling others about Jesus should be an urgent matter. And wonder about Jesus should lead to witness about Jesus. Wonder about Jesus should lead to witness about Jesus. Once we receive the good news, we must report the good news. In her context, it didn't matter that she likely did not have the best reputation. It didn't matter that women weren't supposed to talk to men in public. It didn't matter that women couldn't even officially testify in court. 
this Samaritan woman urgently tells the men of the city to come and see Jesus. You see, as has been said, it's not the quality of the witness that ultimately matters, but the object of the witness. In other words, it's not ultimately about who's talking, but about who's being talked about. And the past or present goodness of God's messenger does not determine the eternal goodness of God's message. So no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, once we've heard the good news, we have to tell the good news. Then John cuts away from the Samaritan woman, starting at John 4.31. John 4.31, it says, In the meantime, the disciples were begging him, saying, Rabbi, please eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Then the disciples began saying to each other, No one brought him something to eat, did they? Jesus says to them, My food is that I should do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Altogether, it's John 4, 27 to 34. Brothers and sisters, doing the will of him who sent us should be the most satisfying and gratifying thing in life. We should be thirsty for theology. We should be hungry for holiness. We should have cravings for Christ. Metaphorically, we should be fiends for following. We should be junkies for Jesus. Then, in John 4.35, Christ continues by saying, Don't you have a saying, four more months, then comes the harvest? Look, I say to you, lift up your eyes and behold the fields that are ripe for harvest. John 4.35. Now, Christ is likely quoting a proverb or a common saying. And four months was thought to be the shortest time between when one planted the seed and when one harvested the crops in a kind of best case scenario. Back then in Palestine, the time between sowing and reaping ranged from four to six months. And the saying likely meant something like, work hard now and it will pay off later. It seems that the saying concerns delayed gratification. That is, if you plant the seeds of hard work now, in a few months, you will reap the fruits of your labor. Also, the word for ripe is more literally translated white. Apparently, when wheat would become ripe, it would turn golden white. In any case, Jesus has just planted the spiritual seed at the well, and the spiritual harvest is about to come a lot sooner than four months. John 4.36 It says, Already, Jesus says, Already, the one who harvests receives pay and gathers fruit for eternal life, so that the one who sows may rejoice together with the one who harvests. John 4.36 Now, it's actually a little unclear as to whether the already should be attached to the end of verse 35 or the beginning of verse 36. Keep in mind that the Greek text did not originally include periods and that verse divisions were not introduced until the 16th century, 1557 and 1560. So John was not saying, let me end verse 35 here and start verse 36 here. Verse divisions are for reference purposes. For reference purposes, they are not a part of the original text. This is why it's always important to not take the Bible, to not take Bible verses out of context. For this is not how the original writers wrote the divinely inspired text. And when translating the text, one always has to make some interpretive decisions. And it seems that most modern translations place already at the beginning of verse 36, 
like we have here. And apparently this adverb usually comes before what it describes. But in any case, already is an appropriate word to connect the two verses, since the fields are already ripe and the harvester is already receiving pay. Now, as has been said, the fact that the harvest, that the reaper or harvester is already getting paid does not necessarily mean that this is a matter of merit. It just shows that the end time harvest has already begun. As always, it's important not to overinterpret metaphorical language. Here, the fact that the harvester is receiving pay likely has no particular meaning except to indicate that the harvest is already underway. That said, whereas it took four months for the natural harvest, it seems that Jesus is saying that the spiritual harvest, the spiritual harvest has arrived already. The spiritual harvest is more immediate. And metaphorically, the fruit or the crops that are being gathered and harvested refer to the people who are believing in Jesus, becoming faithful to Christ. And they will have eternal life, which Christ mentions to the woman at the well. As we discussed in John 4.14, Christ talks about the living water of the Holy Spirit that will well up inside someone, well up up to eternal life. And this theme of the spiritual harvest that will be fully consummated at the end of the age when Christ comes back, this theme is found throughout the Gospels. For instance, in Matthew 9, 37 to 39, 9, 37 to 38, it says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Matthew 9, 37 to 38. You see, many people are ripe for being harvested into the kingdom of God. And we should pray for more people to be busy with God's work of harvesting. Because the alternative to harvest is hellfire. And Jesus depicts this in the striking parable of the weeds. Let's briefly review this parable told in Matthew 13. Beginning at verse 24, it says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30, Let's both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Matthew thirteen twenty seven to 30. And Jesus explains this parable later in the chapter, beginning at verse 36, it says, Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out, they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Matthew 13, 40 to 43. Now, the metaphor here is not exactly the same. In this parable, the harvest refers to the final consummated harvest at the end of the age on judgment day the day where the lord and his angels will separate the faithful from the faithless the sheep from the goats but here in john 4 the harvest christ refers to the harvest refers to bringing people to faith in christ the king the harvest refers to leading others into the kingdom of heaven the kingdom which will be consummated at the end of the age the end of the age, the final harvest. But though the imagery is not exactly the same, I wanted to read the parable of the weeds to emphasize this point. One can be harvested for heaven, or one can be harvested for hell. Therefore, we should work hard as hell for the holy harvest of heaven. We need people who will, who will completely wholly devote themselves to the Redeemer's reaping. As a whole, we need to wholly harvest the holy harvest. But before reaping, there must be sowing. Though a bit different than this parable of the weeds, here in John 4, sowing or spreading seed likely refers to spreading the gospel. As you may recall, in the parable of the sower, which is also in Matthew 13. The good seed that the sower sows refers to the gospel. Now, we've studied the parable of the sower, also called the parable of the four soils, in a previous sermon and study. So for the sake of time, I won't rehash that here, but please check out those previous videos for more details. That said, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6-7, where Paul addresses believers who seem to be more focused on following certain Christian leaders than Christ the Lord, whom they served, he says to the church at Corinth, which he founded, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. 1 Corinthians 3, 6-7. So with similar imagery, so with similar imagery, we see that whether one is metaphorically planting or watering or harvesting, God is always at work, and God is the one who makes things grow. And this brings me to my next point. You see, though this verse is often translated in a way where it says that the one who sows and the one who reaps rejoice together. Grammatically, the sower is actually emphasized more than the reaper. Therefore, although the one who plants the seed and the one who harvests the crop do in fact rejoice together, the sower is more prominent. You know, if someone gives their life to Christ after a conversation or even a worship service that we were part of, we should rejoice because of the spiritual harvest. But we shouldn't be too overly proud of what we may have done because someone else likely planted the seed long before. It likely wasn't their first time hearing the gospel. Brothers and sisters, nobody can claim that they alone brought someone to Christ. And the one who first planted the seed perhaps even more so than the one who harvested the crops, should rejoice. So maybe we should be less focused on how many souls come down the aisle inside of the sanctuary and more focused on how much seed we put down outside the sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, plowing comes before reaping. Planting comes before harvesting. So, if your ministry doesn't seem to be bearing any fruit, 
Don't be discouraged. Keep planting the seed. Keep working the soil. Someone else may harvest the crop after you, as we see in our next verse. But let me take a break here and look at the chat real quick. Good evening, Sister Karen Garrett. Amen, Sister Gil McGinnis Scott. Latanya Cox Badu. Hallelujah. God makes it grow. Amen. Lord, send out more workers. Amen. There's going to be a separation. We've got to plant those seeds. Booth Civils, good evening. Sister Vanetta Harbin, good evening. Annie Harper Smith, good evening. Lavoyne Hamilton, good evening. Mammy E. Kennedy, good evening. Glory to God. Junkie for Jesus, praise the Lord. Sister Jada Gadsden, good evening. Sister Stephanie Smith, good evening. From Kentucky, thanks for joining us from Kentucky. Hello, Sister Selena Higgins Howell. Sister Tysha Cooper. Amen. We got to be on the team. Spread and tell the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Sister Yvonne Vanderhall, good evening. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Deacon Caruth. Amen. Sister Cooper, we're all on the same team. And good evening, Sister Roberta Ricks Gardner. All right. Got to plant the seeds. Glory to God. All right. So verse 37. So in John 4, 37, Jesus continues by saying, For in this the saying is true. One is the one who sows, and another is the one who harvests. John 4, 37. Now, originally, this saying may have meant something like, someone else will profit from the hard work that you put in today. And a similar sentiment may be found in Ecclesiastes 2.18, which says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Ecclesiastes 2.18. You see, originally, this proverb about one person sowing and another person reaping may have been about life's futility. In other words, why work hard when eventually someone else will enjoy the fruits of your labor? No matter how much money you make in your lifetime, when it's all over, you can't take it with you. It will go to someone else. And they might squander everything you've worked for. What you sow today, someone else will reap tomorrow. However, Christ flips this saying. For as we've seen in the previous verse, both the one who plants the seed and the one who harvests the crop rejoice together. The sower and the harvester, the sower and the reaper both rejoice. And you see, Christ can transform a life of futility to a life of fulfillment. For when you dedicate all you have to the Lord, when you follow him with all your heart, soul, and might, when you surrender all to the Savior, when you devote your time, talent, and treasure to holy harvesting, none of your labor for the Lord is in vain. It's the best investment you could ever make, one that can lead to another's eternal life. I mean, is there anything better than everlasting life with the Lord? then what greater cause can there be than converting others to Christ? What greater purpose than pious planting? What greater responsibility than the Redeemer's reaping? What greater service than sowing the Savior's seed of salvation? 
we must be devoted to our divine duty of the holy harvest, that others may reap the fruit of our labor, which is all enabled by the Lord. Amen, Sister Rhodes. Amen, Sister Cox Badu. Good evening, Sister Gadsden. Amen, Sister Rhodes. Yes, he will. Sister Gail McGinnis Scott. Sister Sarah Bogan, good evening. God bless you as well. God bless. All right, verse 38. Jesus says to his disciples, I sent you to harvest that for which you did not labor. Others labored, and you, because of their labor, have benefited. John 4, 38. Now, as you discussed last week, just as God the Father sent Jesus to do his will on earth, Jesus sent us to do his will on earth. As you read in John 20, 21, when the, resur when the resurrected Christ appears to his, his disciples, when the resurrected Christ appears to his disciples, it says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. John 20 to 21. Jesus was sent, and his disciples are sent. And again, as we see in this verse, no one person can claim that they alone brought someone to Christ. Though Christ's disciples may metaphorically gather the crops, someone else has likely already sown the seed. Christ says they are benefiting from the previous labor of others. Now, we don't know for sure, but the others Christ may be referring to, may be referring to, could be the patriarchs and the prophets who prepared the way for the Messiah, the last of whom was John the Baptist. In fact, we have seen that John the Baptist had already rejoiced because Jesus, the bridegroom, had come. In John 3, 28 to 30, John the Baptist says, You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John three twenty-eight to 30 You see, John's joy was already complete before he may have been plowing the ground in preparation for Jesus. But now he can rejoice because Christ has come and has begun the spiritual harvest. Now that said, Christ could also be referring to himself. For Christ has done the hard work and prepared the way for his church's ministry. None of us could do any holy harvesting for the kingdom of Christ, for the kingdom of God, if Christ did not inaugurate the kingdom of God. None of us could plant the seed of the gospel of salvation if there was no Savior. None of us could spread the good news of forgiveness through Christ if Christ did not make a way for forgiveness on the cross. Christ has done the work before us. He has planted the seed. He's laid the groundwork. And we can reap the benefits of his labor. And as we said last week, Christ's food was to do the will of him, was to do the will of him who sent him, and to finish his work. And he finished his God given mission on the cross and then said, It is finished. In any case, whoever the others may be, Jesus says that his disciples are benefiting from the groundwork laid by those who came before them. And in ministry, we too benefit from the groundwork laid by those who came before us. Metaphorically, Christian missions is a team sport. So no missions are solo missions. No one person wins any soul to Christ. As we seek to holy harvest the holy harvest throughout the whole team, there must be partnership 
and cooperation. As I say, teamwork makes the dream work. Thus, as someone once explained to me, when we are spreading the good news, we don't have to try to hit a home run every time we step to the plate. We don't have to try to get someone to decide to follow Jesus every single time. Metaphorically, how about we just try to make contact and get on base? Then perhaps someone will come after us and bring it home. And just like in the major leagues, if you go out there trying to hit a home run every time, you're bound to be disappointed. And likewise, it can be easy to get discouraged to get discouraged if we're sharing the gospel, but it seems that no one is believing the gospel. But just trying to get on base is a much more manageable goal. So let's try to get someone to take baby steps of faith, to take some baby steps of faith. Then, Lord willing, one day someone will have them running for Jesus. And at the end of it all, all who were involved in bringing that person to faith will rejoice together. The whole team. Now, I know we have a lot of football fans, so let me change sports. You ever see a running back break off a really big run, but then get tackled right at the, the one-yard line, the goal line? And then after that play, often the, the coach will substitute that running back for someone else. Maybe because the running back is tired of running down the entire field. But then sometimes the second string running back, who was put in as a substitute, scores on the very next play. A one-yard run after a big 80-yard gain the previous play. You ever see the second string running back get up? They get up all proud of themselves, pounding their chest and dancing for the cameras. So proud. When I used to watch, when I used to watch football games, I'd be like, someone else did all the hard work before you. The guy who got the team on the goal line is now on the sideline. Brothers and sisters, let's not be like these second string running backs who apparently bask in the glory of scoring after someone else does all the hard work. What I'd like to see is when, after scoring a, after scoring a touchdown, after scoring a touchdown, a running back gives the ball to a lineman. You see, running backs can't go anywhere without good blocking. So it's only right that the linemen get to celebrate. And in fact, the whole team should celebrate. When one person scores, the whole team scores. Christian missions were all on the same team. We should rejoice when the team scores, even if we weren't the one to bring the ball across the goal line. We should rejoice even if we ran the second leg of the relay and the anchor crosses the finish line. Let's not think too highly of ourselves if we bring someone to God, because ultimately God is working through us to bring someone to himself. And others have labored before us. So Christ's words can help with our spiritual expectations. Doesn't it give you great confidence knowing that we're all in this together, and that you, and that though you might just plant the seed of the gospel, someone else may harvest it later. Isn't it encouraging knowing that, though you may be laying a lot of groundwork, others may benefit from your labor, and that ultimately it is God who has done the hard work and is now working through us? Brothers and sisters, we know people are stubborn, and that, as Jesus says, most people will not believe in him. But we should understand that at at the end of the day, At the end of the day, we're all on the same winning team. We're all on God's soul winning team. That's why it pains me when I see Christians talking about each other, especially in the presence of non-Christians. You know, it's one thing when you talk about your family members with other members of your family but you don't air your dirty laundry outside the family. And you know, people be ready to to fight. 
people be ready to fight if you say something about their favorite team or their fraternity or their sorority or their political party. But we talk about Christians like it's nothing. No matter our race, sex, economic class, nationality, political affiliation, level of physical maturity, or level of spiritual maturity, we're all on the same team. We're all a part of God's body. Talking about each other in front of non-teammates does the team no favors. For who would want to join a team with no team unity? So as a whole, let's strive to wholly devote ourselves to the holy harvest. Amen. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Sister Audrey Butler, good evening. Elaine Beatty or Batie, good evening. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Sister Gail McGinnis Scott. Sister Sylvia Johnson, good evening. Latanya Cox, Badu, like the uh, the football. All right. Teamwork makes a dream work. Amen. Brother Webster Evans, good evening. God bless you as well. Sister Sylvia Johnson, good evening. God bless you. Leon Sandy. Althea Simpson, Mrs. Minister Simpson, good evening. Glory to God. Team unity is necessary. Amen. All right. John 4, 39. In John 4, 39, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that city believed in him, on account of the word of the woman testifying, he told me everything I ever did. John four thirty nine. So, after cutting away from the Samaritan woman and her testimony to the men of the city, to the men of the city, John now cuts back to that scene. And as you said, the Samaritan woman likely did not have the best reputation. As you read in John 4, 17, she's had five ex-husbands and is shacking up with yet another lover. And as you said, in this context, men and women were not supposed to talk in public, nor could women testify in court. Yet, in spite of this, her testimony clearly bears fruit. Her testimony clearly bears fruit. There is a great spiritual harvest. For many Samaritans are believing in Jesus. Christ has just said, look and see, because the metaphorical, the metaphorical fields were ripe for the harvest. And now we look and see the fruit of the testimony of the Samaritan woman. Jesus talks about the spiritual harvest, and this is Exhibit A. Many Samaritans are believing because of her testimony. And this goes to show that though God is always at work, our human testimony is also important. In ministry, we are not only cooperating with God's people, but with God himself. Now in John, believing in Jesus is an important expression we find again and again. For example, in John 3.36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. John 3.36 And as has been said, there is a difference between belief that and belief in. Belief that is mere intellectual assent, agreeing with, an, with a certain proposition. In contrast, Belief in entails corresponding action. It's belief that manifests itself in behavior. You see, someone can believe that diet and exercise is good for their physical health. Someone can believe that following a physician's orders can be good for their physical well-being. But if someone believes that those things are true, yet doesn't act accordingly, what good is it? 
Likewise, someone can believe that putting one's trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins is good for their spiritual health. Someone can believe that following the great physician's orders, the great physician's orders can be good for their spiritual well-being. But if someone believes that those things are true, yet doesn't act accordingly, what good is it? As James says in James 2.19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. James 2.19. And as we find in Mark 3.11, when Jesus would drive out demons, it says, Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Mark 3.11. So even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is Lord. We must believe in Jesus as Lord. And genuine belief, genuine belief, genuine faith manifests itself in works of godly obedience and compassion. True faith is faith in action. And the Samaritans put their faith in action by actively coming to see Jesus. And unlike elsewhere in John, here we see that their belief in Jesus was not based on one of his mighty works, but on the word of this woman. And again, when the woman, when the woman says, when the woman says, he told me everything I ever did. He told me everything I did. Again, she's likely using hyperbole. She's exaggerating to make her point. But clearly, they take her point to heart. Amen. Could you imagine meeting someone who told you everything about your life? Glory to God. Amen, Sister Cox Badu. Good evening, Sister Michelle Ann Spring. Good evening. And Sister Karee Siler. Good evening, Sister Siler. Amen. Team Jesus. Got to make some shirts. Team Jesus. All right. John 4.40. It says, So, when the Samaritans came to him, they were begging him to stay with them, and he remained there two days. John 4, verse 40. Now, this word begging is the same word used in John 4, 31, where the disciples were begging Jesus to eat some food, to eat some food. And apparently Jesus eventually got some food because he spent a night or two with these Samaritans. Now, as you may recall, back then, hospitality was an important virtue. It was common to provide food and shelter to travelers who likely had few other options. You know, nowadays, if we have relatives and friends coming into town, we might not feel like cleaning the whole house and preparing a room for them to spend a few nights. Many times, it's a lot easier just to get them a room at a nearby hotel. But back then, there weren't a great number of anything resembling hotels. And many inns had reputations for being home to questionable characters. It wouldn't be right to let people their belongings. And it would be considered rude to deny people a place to stay. So hospitality was expected. However, it wasn't expected between Jews and Samaritans. As we discussed many times, Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. So by remaining with them and likely sleeping in a Samaritan home, eating Samaritan food, Samaritan food, and taking advantage of some Samaritan hospitality, Jesus is again breaking cultural norms. You see, this would be roughly equivalent to someone breaking the cultural norms of 1950s segregation. Yet Christ is more concerned with his kingdom community than with conventional customs. Also, as has been said, in the Gospel of John, this word remain, in Greek it's meno, has theological overtones. 
This is the same word Jesus uses in John 15 when metaphorically describing himself as the true vine and his disciples as the branches. Starting in verse 4, it says, Remain in me, and I will in you. Just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself if it does not remain in the vine, in the same way, neither are you if you do not, if you do not remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in them. This person produces much fruit, because without me you are unable to do anything. John 15, 4 to 5. So once again, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We cannot bear godly fruit, let alone reap the fruit of God's holy harvest without him. In any case, Jesus remaining with them in Samaria likely lays the groundwork and prepared the soil for Philip, who brought about great joy in Samaria by proclaiming the gospel. Later, in Acts 8, starting at verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all, played, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Acts 8, 4 to 8. Later in verse 14 to 17, it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers, for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, 14, 17. So, so it seems that Peter and John's ministry benefited from the previous work of Philip and that Philip's ministry benefited from the previous works from the previous work of Jesus you see you never know by talking to someone about Jesus today you never know how someone else may build on your groundwork tomorrow so let's strive to holy harvest God's holy harvest then in John 4:41 Good evening, Sister Gail Thomas. Good evening, Sister Gwen Gambrell. Then in John 4, 41, it says, And many more believed on account of his word. And many more believed on account of his word. John 4, 41. So it appears that the woman, that the testimony of the woman led to many people coming to faith in Christ. Her testimony led to many people coming to faith in Christ. And because those people come to faith in Christ and they implore Christ to stick around for a few more days, even more people come to Christ because of that. So notice how Christ encountered with this one woman at the well who likely had one of the worst reputations in town led to widespread salvation in town. You see, you never know how telling one person about Jesus can lead to others in their family, on their job, and in their community also coming to Christ. And who knows who those people might tell, and who the people they tell may tell. Recall that Christ started the church with 12 guys, 12 disciples, and now there's a couple billion Christians worldwide. 2,000 years later. Brothers and sisters, let's go out and spread the seed of the gospel. For we never know how big a tree might grow to be. Also, just like Peter and Nathaniel earlier in chapter 1, 
the Samaritans had to come and see Jesus for themselves. They had initial faith based on someone else's testimony, but they must come to know Christ firsthand. So as we read in our final verse for tonight, in John 4, 42, it says, And to the woman they said, No longer do we believe on account of what you said, because we ourselves have heard, and we know that this man is truly the Savior of the world. John 4, 42. You see, as we've said, it's not just about agreement with certain principles of Christianity. It's about an encounter with the person of Christ. First, they believe because of what she said about the Savior. Now, they believe because they've seen the Savior, because of what they've seen from the Savior. They get more clarity by going straight to the source. Metaphorically, they, they hear from the horse... Metaphorically, they hear from the holy horse's mouth. They listen to the lamb. They've seen the Messiah, who the Samaritan woman has already said would tell them all things. As you read in John 4, 25 to 26, it says, The woman says to him, I know that Messiah, the one who is called Christ, is coming. Whenever he comes, that man will explain everything to us. Jesus says to her, I, the one who is speaking to you, I am that man. John 4, 25 to 26. The woman proclaims that the Messiah would explain. And now the Samaritans hear the Messiah explain because of what the woman proclaimed. They no longer have a secondary faith that is based upon someone else's testimony. It is based on a personal experience with Jesus. Likewise, all of us have to personally commit ourselves to Christ. Brothers and sisters, we can't rely on our mother's faith, our father's faith, nor our grandmother's faith. We don't want a secondhand faith. We want a firsthand faith. We all must know Jesus for ourselves. For example, many of us know a lot about Barack Obama. We may know where he's from. We may know what he's done, some names of the members of his family, etc., etc. Some may have a picture of him hanging in their house. Some may have a picture of his wife all over their purse. But that doesn't mean that we really know Barack Obama. As I've said before, there's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone personally. Likewise, many of us may know a lot about Jesus. We may know where he's from. We may know what he's done. Some names of the members of his family, etc., etc. We may have a picture of him hanging in our house. We may have a picture of his cross all over our purse. But that doesn't mean that we really know Jesus. It doesn't mean we know Jesus personally. We all must have our own personal relationship with our personal Lord and Savior. As Jesus, the Good Shepherd says later in John 10, 3-4, when contrasting a true shepherd of the sheep and a bandit, he says of a true shepherd, to him, the gatekeeper opens the gate and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he sends out all of his sheep, he travels in front of them, and the sheep follow him because they have known his voice. And later in John ten fourteen and 15, it says, or he says, I am the shepherd, the good one, and I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10, 14, 15.
Now, we've had several previous lessons on Jesus, the good shepherd, so I won't rehash all of that here. But suffice it to say that all who are truly Christ's sheep truly know Christ. True sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd and follow him faithfully. Now, during his life on earth, in Scripture, Jesus is only called Savior one more time, one other time. In Luke 2, beginning at verse 10, when the angel of the Lord appears to the shepherds, it says, And the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, for you has been born a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Luke 2, 10 to 11. So imagine that. Imagine that Jesus is called Savior by an angel and by the Samaritans, the hated enemies of the Jews. That said, more generally, in this time period, the term Savior could be used to describe heroes, emperors, and pagan gods, like the Roman Emperor Hadrian and the Greek god Zeus. And we don't know if the Samaritans had a full understanding of Christian salvation or of Jesus as a divine Savior. But they know that, at least in some sense, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Not just of the Jews, not just of the Samaritans, but of the whole world, to all peoples. As we've said, the Jews look down on the Samaritans ethnically, ethnically, as ethnically and religiously impure. In the eyes of the Jerusalem of the people of Jerusalem, in the eyes of the Jews, Samaritans were second class citizens. They were second class. Also in John four twenty two, Christ tells the woman, He says to her, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We Jews worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. John four twenty two. And indeed, indeed, salvation comes from the Jews, since Jesus the Savior was Jewish. Salvation comes from the Jews. Yet salvation comes not really for the Jews. Christ came for people of all nations. As we read in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Jesus tells his, his disciples, Christ says to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and listen, I am with you always until the consummation of the age. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. So what a joy. What a joy for the Samaritans to be insiders of the kingdom community of Christ. When before they were often considered outsiders. And as we read last week, in John three sixteen and 17, it says, For in this way God loved the world, that he gave the one-of-a-kind Son, so that everyone who is continually faithful to him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But to save the world through him. That's John three sixteen seventeen. 17. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now, there are currently billions of Christians in the world, across every continent and virtually every major people group. And all true Christians are all a part of the same winning, the same soul-winning team. And when that team scores, 
the whole team should rejoice. As a whole, let's strive to holy harvest the holy harvest. And no matter what people think about you because of your race, sex, class, ethnicity, political affiliation, your level of physical maturity, or level of spiritual maturity, no matter what Christ thinks you are to die for, and he gave his life to save yours. Amen. We need more anointing. Glory to God, Sister Latanya Cox Badu. Tanya Conway, good evening. Amen. The sheep know his voice. This is Gail McGinnis Scott. McGinnis Scott says, Knowing Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Amen. Uncle Thomas, good evening. This is Yvonne Rhodes. Hallelujah. Each one reach one, each one teach one. I like that. This is Michelle Ann Spring. This is Yvette McCoy, good evening. God bless you all. All right. Oh, it's getting late. Sorry about that. All right. So in conclusion, in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, the work Jesus was sent to do was finished on the cross. This is why he said it is finished. The Lord has done all the hard work. And he is still always at work. He makes the seeds grow. But let's allow him to work through us in his harvest field. Allow the Lord to use us as his vessels to reap the spiritual harvest. That is, those who are faithful to Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. And by the power of the Spirit, let's spread the seed of the gospel. For if it falls on good soil, We'll never know how big a tree might grow to be. Let's remember, though some might plant the seed and some might harvest the crops, we're all on the same team. And teamwork makes the dream work. And at the end of it all, one can be harvested for heaven or one can be harvested for hell. Therefore, we should work hard as hell for the holy harvest of heaven. Let's completely and joyfully dedicate ourselves to harvesting, imploring for people to be, to be faithful to the Savior of the world. With God's help, let's wholly harvest the holy harvest. May the Lord bless you and keep you. So let's close with a word of prayer. Get this song ready. How to get this song ready? We gotta rejoice in the Lord. Glory to God, Sister Rhodes. Sister Deborah King Benton. God bless you. Sister Stephanie Cunningham. Good evening. Well, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Appreciate you. God is great, Sister Thomas. Have a blessed night as well. God bless us to Brenda Smith. To God be the glory. Let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we just thank you for saving our souls, Lord God. Thank you for planting the seed of the gospel in us and harvesting us for eternal life, Lord God. That someone put in some work in our lives, Lord God. And gave us the word of the truth. That all who are faithful to Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have everlasting life, Lord God. And now that we have received the good news, now that we have received the gospel, help us report the gospel. Help us to tell the good news, Lord God. Spreading the seed, Lord God. And even if we do not harvest the crop, we know that someone else can come before, or someone else can come after us, Lord God. 
and many have come before us, Lord God. We're all on the same team, Lord God. Help us to wholly harvest the holy harvest. And help us to do so with joy, Lord God. The one who sows and the one who reaps will have joy together. We'll rejoice together. So let's rejoice, Lord God. Help us rejoice and be about your business each and every day, Lord God. There's nothing better, nothing better than eternal life with you. So there's nothing else that we should that we should be more devoted to each and every day. Lord God, we thank you for the time we have together, Lord God. Thank you for allowing us to gather virtually, Lord God, and to talk about and spread your word, Lord God. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to keep spreading seed, to keep being busy on the harvest field, Lord God, that you might be glorified and we can all rejoice together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Appreciate you. Good evening, Sister Gwen. Good evening, Sister Gambro. God bless you. Look at the chat real quick. I'm sorry for again. Hopefully my pimple will be, will be gone from my nose next week. All right. Glory to God. Latanya Cox Badu, thanks for joining. The Cunninghams. God bless you. Travel back to Kentucky safely. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Cunningham. Amen. Mr. Smith. Amen. Mr. Spring. Hallelujah. Mr. Cox Badu. Mr. Julia Ross, good evening. All right. Have a good night. Excuse me. Have a good night. Thank you for, for joining us. Amen. Sister Cooper. We got to be good teammates for the one mission. That spread God's word. Glory to God and bring those to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen, sister. Cooper, God bless you. Thank you for joining us, Brother Cunningham. Glory to God. Glory to God. God is excellent. Thank you, Sister S. McDougal Johnson. Have a blessed evening. Amen, Auntie Lynn. Sister Emma Dillard, God bless you. God is great, Sister Thomas. God is great, Sister Smith. Thank you for watching, Sister Hill. God is wonderful. God bless you. Brother Lamont Jones, have a good one. Amen, Sister Robin Smith. Amen, Auntie Lynn. God is great, Sister Dorsey. God bless you as well. Have a blessed night, Sister Alice Palmer. This is Karee Saller. Good to see you on YouTube. Amen. God bless you as well. Amen. Our lives were to die for. That's more than enough. Amen, Sister Pat. Have a good evening as well, Sister Pat. God bless you. Amen, Sister Cunningham. God bless you. Have a good night in Christ Jesus. All right. Next week, hopefully, we will get back to the Sermon on the Mount and start making our way through that again. God bless you.